So welcome everyone to our second colloquium of this spring semester for the Center of, uh, for Global Ethics and Politics. And we are co-sponsoring an event that was organized by the Group on Minorities. Is it and or in? Um, it in philosophy. In philosophy. And, and, and also, and, and, and <laughs> in and and philosophy. In and. Uh, in slash and. OK. So uh, in a second, I will just introduce Nick to say a few words about the unusual format. But the first part of this is not going to be very unusual. We just want to um, introduce our, um, our fantastic speaker. We're really delighted to be hosting this. And I'd like to welcome everyone on Zoom who has been able to join us. Um, we are gonna have the talk from, from the standpoint of, of my side of things. Uh, we're gonna have the talk by uh, David Kim, followed by questions about the talk directly from people here, as well as from anyone on Zoom. And um, then there's gonna be the, the usual minorities and philosophy, um, sort of what's it called, round table discussion. Uh, so we will continue broadcasting, I suppose, but um, that part is uh, going to be led by Nicholas Whitaker. So um, we're delighted today to be featuring David Kim, who is at the University of San Francisco, where he is professor of philosophy and a member of the Asian Studies and Asian American Studies programs. Um, as we noted on the flyer, his research areas include political philosophy, philosophy of race, decolonial and comparative philosophy, and philosophy of emotion. Uh, I was going to ask you before how you pronounce the title of your new book. Is it oh, Zenos or Zenos? Uh, yeah. um, or either, I think either is fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so his new book, uh, which he's currently finishing, yes. is American Zenos. Zenos. Sure. <laughs> Uh, on Asian American critique and the challenges of democracy. So that's a major project and very important. Uh, and he's been a recipient of an NEH chair in humanities and a fellowship at the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research, which I think is at Harvard, is that right? Yes. You left that out. No. <laughs> Was that unintentional? <laughs> uh, he's also chaired the APA uh, Committee on the Status of Asian and Asian American Philosophies philosophers and philosophies, and co-founded the North American Korean Philosophy Association, of which Maya is the newest member, I trust. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I just wanted to, Anybody's to take note of a couple of his most recent uh, publications. They have great titles. Uh, one is Asian American Philosophy and Feminism in the Oxford Handbook of Feminist Philosophy. Then another is Racist Love, that is open to a lot of puns, but it's terrible. <laughs> terrible. Yeah. Uh, Coined in the 1960s. <laughs> um, alterity, analectics, and the challenge of epistemic decolonization uh, was another recent one. <laughs> and um, undoing Western hegemony, unpacking the particulars. Uh, some great titles. So we're delighted to hear your talk today on U.S. imperialism and Asian American racialization. Please join me in welcoming David Kim. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this is actually a, a much fuller group than I expected. Uh, I, I know that many of you came from a, a seminar, so this must be really exhausting to come from a seminar to to a two-hour talk. But so, but I, I appreciate the. I appreciate the participation. Apparently, this is going to be very participatory because there's a very experimental Q&A that's about to happen. I'll try my best to stay within about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, I'm going to read for a good bit of the paper and then um, uh, just try to work with the uh, PowerPoint. Um, this is part of a larger project and uh, a book project on uh, Asian Americans, how to think about them racially, politically. A lot of the, my focus has been on... Um, uh, xenophobia and racism, and the domestic context of immigration naturalization type debates. But uh, I've been trying to talk more about imperialism and what type of racial formation it might offer. So this is a, kind of an experimental talk that will precede the experimental Q&A. So uh, <laughs> um, any insights, comments, criticisms are, are most welcome. I'm, I'm very grateful. And um, I'm this obviously wouldn't have happened without a number of people opening their uh, uh, opening uh, this center. 
um, and, and the resources here at CUNY. So I, I want to first uh, thank uh, Professor Linda Martinakov, a former professor of mine um, <laughs> at, at Syracuse University uh, for making the initial connections and um, uh, Professor Carol Gould for opening up the center. And I know that um, many students, uh, let me see, make sure I've got this right, Nicholas, Maya, Jordan, and pa 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 what, but, Patricia. Uh, yeah, Patricia, yeah. Patricia, okay. Um, Patricia, so thank you so much. I appreciate this. Um, okay, so um, let me start with some framing remarks. Um, I think that xenophobic racism and U.S. imperialism are two of the most significant factors in Asian racialization and subordination. Uh, U.S. Uh, oh my God, you you yeah. Uh, U.S. civic narratives about racism and a good portion of philosophy of race in virtue of following the civic narratives have been configured by a black-white binary. This binary does some good things. It centralizes uh, enslavement and its aftermath, animalization stereotypes, the civil rights movements, uh, key legal historic landmarks like Dred Scott, the 16th Amendment, Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus Board of Education, and institutional violence in the form of slave patrols, police profiling, and prison pipeline. So I think there's no arguing against the importance of these ideas and the necessity of sustained opposition to anti-Black racism. At the same time, the experience of Asian Americans uh, cannot be characterized, as the Black-White binary suggests, as that of Blacks only less so or black light, uh, L-I-T-E, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, or, and sometimes even, this has been coming up in California, sometimes Asian Americans are depicted as white adjacent. I think that's the new expression. Mm -hmm. uh, the understanding of Asian American uh, experience requires additional frameworks, like those analyzing US xenophobia and US imperialism, elements that are not central to the African American experience. Um, they may be more central to African experience, actually. Right? So, and the stakes are higher. The problem is not simply that we lack philosophical focus on xenophobia and imperialism, something that renewed scholarship can correct. It's also that this is a symptom of a larger civic problem of social epistemic injustices or epistemologies of ignorance that help sustain Asian American subordination and often prevent Asian Americans themselves from uh, possessing critical interpretive resources to undo this subordination. So in, in other work, I've discussed xenophobia and its corollary xenophilia. Here I take up the issue of imperialism. And I wanna add the caveat, this is uh, a full discussion of this large issue is just, just uh, way beyond the smaller aims of this essay. Um, I'm, I'm, just, um, I'm gonna also try to make as much contact as possible with uh, and use of mainstream uh, thought as possible. Uh, so I'm going to invoke a good bit of political liberalism, um, and at some point, perhaps we could talk about one of its counterparts, uh, realist international relations theory. I don't know if people are familiar with that. There's a, there's a lot of interesting work there. Um, um, okay, so the, the reason I do this is that I worry that imperialism as a topic generally re relegated to radical scholarship. So yeah, I don't know if you've ever been to the RPA, the Radical Philosophy Association, that's probably a place where you see a lots of talks on imperialism. Uh, but in the APA, not so much. <laughs> um, I think I've only seen like one in like five years or something like that, whereas the RPA, it's, a, it's part of the constant backdrop, if not the explicit topic of the paper, right? Okay. Um, so um, I, uh, <clears throat> After all, imperialism configures the basic structure of a society. The problem assess, um, assessing this, of course, is that such radical configuring or distorting is done to another's society. I'll start with a bit of conceptual clarification. Um, um, yeah, I, I, can, I can switch it forward here. Um, of, of the notion of imperialism, then explicate this notion further in terms of, uh, should this... Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to spend a, a decent chunk of time thinking about this in terms of mainstream uh, philosophy. Uh, since uh, since there's a there is an increasing awareness of good philosophical work on the nature of race and racism, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on imperialism per se rather than on race and racism. Right? Um, okay, so. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to discussion of some exemplary features of U.S. imperialism as Amerasian domination. Uh, by Amerasian, I mean the domination of Latin America and Asia, just combining those words. It's not unique to me. I've heard it in uh, various other uh, venues. Um, the regions here are so large and the history so long 
Uh, I'm only gonna gesture to the larger phenomenon and offer some consideration of some exemplary elements. And then uh, I'll consider the upshot of all this for Asian American racialization processes. And more than anything, I just wanna encourage more philosophical work on US imperialism and Asian racialization. Okay, so what is imperialism? Uh, I think for most people, imperialism is understood in terms of the concepts of sovereignty or national autonomy on the one hand, and exploitation or some other type of material gain on the other. Uh, imperialism is regarded to be a dominance relation between nations, the point of which is commonly exploitation or material gain. Uh, put another way, an imperial nation exerts its autonomy uh, and power by consistently and consequentially, structurally, we might say, uh, infringing upon or diminishing the autonomy of the imperialized or subject nation. And what is infringed upon or diminished in this activity is sovereignty abilities. The sovereignty abilities may be first order as in a nation's ability to enact its own policies, like its own sea vessels exercising fishing rights to drop nets in an oceanic zone without another nation's navy intervening. Uh, they can be second order as in a nation's being able to form and authorize policies themselves as when Congress authorizes certain maritime institutions to allow or prohibit fishing in certain areas or at certain times of the year. And presumably this without say a colonial office taking legal jurisdiction away from Congress and remove its treaty making rights, a meta right. Uh, as far as I know, the US has never experienced this, right? <laughs> but most countries in the world have, right? Um, so we have uh, policy enacting first order and policy making second order abilities. And clearly the latter is more interesting so far as sovereignty is concerned since they are normative or authority powers. Another second order ability is something utterly fundamental and commonly the focal point of imperialism discussions. <clears throat> Namely a nation being able to conduct an indigenous political process of power transfer or authority installation which is very nearly sovereignty itself, as in election processes that are undisturbed by say, paramilitary groups backed by an imperial nation, threatening voters and vote uh, counters, or even threatening a coup d'etat. And thinking about these abilities, it, it seems clear that the second order abilities, the sovereignty articulating or sovereignty sustaining abilities are really at the heart of the matter of the dominance relation that is imperialism. So gathering these ideas, we can say, uh, imperialism is one nation's structural diminishment of another nation's sovereignty abilities, especially the second order, and typically with the aim of material gain. I, I don't want to be pinned down as, um, I don't want that to be pinned down as a definition. Let's just call it a working characterization. Um, I think it captures a lot of intuitions. I, what I want is an account that's not overly radical. Um, that's something that's um, fairly broad so that um, people who are like middle road liberals, not just radicals can talk, even conservatives I think can talk about this. A little bit later, I'll, I'll mention um, realist, social, uh, realist international relations theory, people who advise the White House. Um, and I think they can get on board with this too. Okay? Of course, they have a different normative assessment of these things. Um, okay, so, um, and I think the, the reference to material gain is important. Imperialism is not some kind of mere jockeying or bullying. It typically, it's typically a calculated scheme of extortion. Um, and, and I want to acknowledge that a Marxist will of course characterize this domination relation uh, in a way that explanatorily prioritizes material forces. Um, I, I want to also recognize that in Rawlsian language, these second order abilities are at the core of the basic structure of society. Thus imperial domination structurally affects the allocation of basic goods in a subject nation. And the structure is typically parasitic where such allocation is to the benefit of the imperial nation's allocation of basic goods to its citizens, imperial citizens, right? Okay, so the characterization of orders and abilities uh, orders of ability and material gain may help us to see how imperialistic dominance can be infiltrative and embedded. The imperialist nation uses its range of powers to reconfigure to its own advantage the geography, politics, law, culture, epistemic resources, self-conception, and especially the economy of the dominated nation. As many point out, the most typical operations of imperialism are the expropriation of land, raw materials, and even people from the subordinated country. But no less important, highly infiltrative and embedded is the reconstruction of the subject nation's markets, 
labor force and general productive relations to increase systematically the imperial nation's capital accumulation. You don't have to be a Marxist to agree with these things. Right? Uh, in other words, as Lenin and other theorists and imperialists have contended, the exploitative dominance often takes a viral form as when the host economy is turned capitalist or capitalist in a particular way um, in order that its market dynamics can be manipulated to the profit of the imperialist nation. And I have to say too, um, I'm about to talk about parasites. Uh, so I'm, I'm mixing metaphors. I know the way viruses damage bodies is different than the way parasites do. So forget I said viral, but I just I had to use that. Okay. I think maybe because of all, yeah. Okay. So the point about infiltration and parasitic embeddedness, uh, or this point about it, um, helps us to understand why an imperial nation would be invested in peaceful relations with a subject nation. Because um, I think when we talk about imperialism, there's a focus on wars of conquest. No doubt that is one of the imp most important mechanisms for generating imperialism or maintaining imperialism. But I think um, given what I just said about uh, transfer reconstruction of the economy of subject nations, peaceful or relatively superficially conflict-free relations is much better for imperialism, right? So one common response by imperialized nations is to make claims on the right to self-determination and then wage a war of national liberation. Well, the fore foregoing may help us to see why imperialized nations sometimes do not make such claims and do not wage such wars. Now, obviously there will be a contingent within an imperialized nation that will want these things, but the, the, the nation's government often do not do these things. Imperial nations profit from a relative peace in a subject nation because extraction of resources, exploitation, or super exploitation of colonial workers, and simply the everyday underdeveloping operations of the global capitalist economy continue without disruption to the benefit of the imperial nation. Parasites that do well, um, um, they, they do well to not kill their hosts. Smart ones will benefit their hosts in very specific self-serving ways. So the imperialist nation may temporarily stave off conflict with a subject nation by supporting, among other things, aspects of the dominant nation's economy to prevent mass civil unrest, which seems to be a support of the first order, the policy enacting abilities of the subject nation. For example, the US may support grain production or coal distribution in another country, uh, again, to prop them up so that exploitation can continue. So a dominated nation's exercise of its first order abilities may actually converge with the empire's parasitic interests. And perhaps some expressions of second order abilities as well. Two of the classic ways in which an imperialist nation exercises its dominance in an infiltrative and embedded way, its manipulation of the sovereignty articulating and uh, sustaining abilities of the subordinated, subordinated nation is to set up a colonial administration often surrounded by a settler colony or to install an indigenous dictator surrounded by foreign imperial liaisons. Uh, before moving forward, I think this general characterization not only captures many intuitions about imperialism, um, let me see. <clears throat> but it also is aligned with normative critiques that would be issued by political liberals like Rawlsians and neo-Republicans like Philip Petit and Frank Lovett. So political liberals would criticize imperialism's violation of non-interference. Neo-Republicans would criticize how imperialism imposes a structured vulnerability to arbitrary rule. Since I've mentioned neo-republicanism, I should add that I am not using the word domination in exactly uh, the sense uh, this position does, but clearly there's considerable overlap. So whenever I say domination, don't read a Philip Petit-like characterization into it, although they're closely related. And the reason, again, why I bring this up is I just want uh, to keep uh, pushing a, a general notion of imperialism that's compatible with political liberalism, um, near Republicans, and even um, advisors to the White House. Uh, that portion, um, the, again, it's the called realist um, international relations theory. Um, I, I've taken most of it out of the paper, but maybe we could, it could come back up in the um, experimental Q&A. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so I've characterized imperialism as one nation's structural diminishment of another nation's sovereignty abilities especially of the second order and typically with the aim of material gain. Also the general pattern of the structural diminishment is not just extractive, but generative and infiltrative as in the case of economic reconstruction, specifically capitalist underdevelopment. 
and this infiltration or embeddedness is used by imperial nations to try to reduce surface conflict as they assist the subject nation in exercising their own first order abilities while diminishing their second order abilities. Okay, for reasons of time, um, obviously we can't cover all the salient instances of how the US has structurally diminished the sovereignty abilities of Latin American and Asian nations. But as the detailed historical work of William Appleman Williams, Walter LaFleur, Greg Grandin, and others show, there's ample evidence that structural diminishment of sovereignty abilities and parasitic reconstruction occurred in virtually all Latin American countries. Uh, the careful historical work of Marilyn Young, Bruce Cummings, uh, again, Walter LaFleur and others, clarifies that the same can be said of most Northeast and Southeast Asian countries, not all of them, but many of them. Uh, the one complication in this context is the emergence of a rival imperial nation, Japan, of course. The instantiations of the domination relation include bald-faced imperial takeover and dominion. Uh, for example, the insular sovereignty of the U.S. over Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, the Philippines for many years, um, or direct rulership of Okinawa by the U.S. Department of Navy uh, for a couple decades after World War II. There's coercive diplomacy, like Commodore Perry's infamous opening of the Japan market. Uh, arguably creation of um, what's called Plan Colombia and the Andean Counter Narcotics Initiative, manipulative diplomacy. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but the, there's a really important secret meeting um, um, that produced the Taft Katsura Agreement of 1905, in which Japanese and American diplomats, after the Japanese Russian War, uh, got together to set up. Um, the imperial landscape of East Asia for for, uh, for several decades. Right? Um, there's uh, various kinds of uh, surrogate sovereignty, direct uh, uh, de facto control through dictator installation. For example, the U.S. supporting repressive puppet governments like the Marcos regime in the Philippines, the Re regime in South Korea, or by economic manipulation through control of market and investment structures like the U.S. banking control of Chinese railways after the issuance of John Hay's open door policy in the late 1900s, or so late 19th century, or the do economic dominance of Panama through commercial control of the lucrative canal, the free reign given to the U.S.-based United Fruit Company there, et cetera, et cetera. So in most of these cases, and usually a number of these tactics are employed simultaneously, some sort of unequal diplomatic dialectic is established. But where these have failed to favor the aims of the dominating uh, nation, other means have been pursued. Uh, the U.S., for example, has employed um, the following measures for compliance or regime change. Famously, assassination. I don't know if people know about uh, Fidel Castro's explosive cigar. Um, support of coup d'etat, as I said, like uh, the ousting of Argentina's Allende. Uh, funding and training of repressive forces at the School of the Americas, now interestingly retitled to the Western Hemispheric Institute for Security Cooperation. Um, embargoes, unequal comprehensive economic matrices, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So I just want to just make sure this is clear without getting into you know, any further into this history, that there, there really are these very, very detailed studies that gets into uh, the micro details of how the abstract relations mentioned at the beginning are actually instantiated, like over and over again across these countries across time, right? Okay. Um, and just to be clear too, notice that not all these tactics are tantamount to imperialism. Again, imperialism is not mere conflict or jockeying between nations. So we need to look at the overall pattern to see how these means are gathered together to generate the sort of political system that is imperialism. So neither war nor peace per se demonstrates the presence of imperialism, since both war and peace are compatible with, and depending on context, help to consolidate the deformative or parasitic relation characteristic of imperialism. Uh, I think two particularly emblematic instances of U.S. imperialism are the Monroe Doctrine of 1823 in Latin America and the Root Takahira Agreement uh, in Asia, uh, 1908. Uh, I'll br briefly discuss the first um, and focus on the second. So, um, U.S. You all familiar with the Monroe Doctrine? I'm just, I'm not, not everybody knows. It. Okay. So um, U.S. President James Monroe presented to Congress in 1823 a declaration to European countries, which had recently concluded the Napoleonic Wars. The declaration explains uh, the U.S. perspective on internal European affairs thus, quote, our policy in regard to Europe, which was adopted at, at an early stage of the wars, which have so long agitated that quarter of the globe, nevertheless remains the same, which is not to interfere in the internal concerns of any of its powers. 
to consider the government de facto as a legitimate government for us, to cultivate friendly relations with it, and to preserve those relations by a frank, firm, and manly policy. <laughs> yeah, I did, uh, you know where to end the quote, but I had to get in the frank, <laughs> firm, and manly. And, um, uh, end quote. So the declaration goes on to assert due symmetry, issuing a parent principle expressing the rights and interests of the United States, namely, quote, that the American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain, are henceforth not to be considered as a subject for future colonization by any European powers, um, end quote. Um, so the normative, this, this um, is something that's talked about over and over again by historians, uh, decolonial scholars and others, right? So the normative framework is widely considered to be uh, the, the most important guiding principle and really the vehicle of white hemisphere control by the US. The US in essence claimed the Americas with no indigenous or Latin American leaders um, having any authority to challenge this decree. decree. Uh, and if we, uh, actually, if we pause for a moment, this is actually really extraordinary to have this type of agreement, right? As recent work by Thomas McCarthy and um, much work in critical history, critical race theory and philosophy has shown, the US functions here as a racial state developing and enforcing policy in a hemisphere, uh, in a hemisphere <clears throat> in a unilaterally claimed for itself. It's widely known that Latin Americans were racialized as lacking the ability to self-govern among other things and needed US tutelage, but consider too that as historian Walter Lefebvre has pointed out, President Theodore Roosevelt, for example, he really uh, did believe that the US controlled Panama Canal would have a civilizing effect on the racial others surrounding it. Of course, the project was a business and military venture as well, but his motives were mixed in this way. In addition, his successor of uh, Taft really did seem to believe that left to their own devices, Panamanians, especially black Panamanians, could bog down the smooth uh, operations of the canal. <laughs> in this specific racialized respect, he made the analogy to Haitians allegedly running down their own country, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's, that's a, a great deal of work on the presence of um, racial ideologies shaping this type of imperialistic dominance. And the, the Monroe Doctrine is one of the um, uh, centuries long, actually now it's um, 200 years in existence. Huh? This is a, the 200th anniversary of it. Uh, this is like the normative shaping structure, right? Uh, the really fundamental meaning giving structure. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let's switch to the Ruth Takahira agreement of 1908. This is uh, far less known uh, than the Monroe Doctrine. So in 1908, the US and Japan adopted the same type of inter-imperial agreement that works so well in the Monroe, uh, in the case of the Monroe Doctrine. In fact, historians often call this the 19, uh, 1908, 1908 agreement, the Asian Monroe Doctrine. Uh, th this agreement states the following backdrop, quote, the exchange of views between us, this is uh, the US and Japan, has shown that Japan and the U United States holding important outlying insular possessions, AKA colonies, in the region of the Pacific Ocean, the governments of the two countries are animated by a common aim, policy, and intention in that region. It then lays out five bilateral interim imperial commitments. One, the mutual encouragement of commerce. Okay, no, no problem there. Two, uh, maintaining the status quo and China access. So the maintenance, um, uh, uh, and the three, the colonial status quo. Uh, there's a proviso that explicitly states respect the territorial possessions belonging to each other in said region. There's also this uh, latent in number four, indirect uh, imperialism China. They call it preserving the independence and integrity of China uh, and also the principle of equal opportunity. But um, I, I don't have time to get into it, but they, they had uh, developed what's called the open door policy which uh, weakened China's sovereignty uh, with regard to trade in various of its port cities. One of the, um, uh, the worst examples of this is the eventual fall of Hong Kong to British control. And if some of you know, uh, some decades ago, it was released back to England, right? But um, even when it wasn't controlled by, completely controlled by a country like England, uh, many of the ports had, um, uh, uh, the, the Chinese government lost more or less uh, direct control over it. Uh, a lot of it was ceded to a whole variety, even like German, uh, uh, the, Germany, it's not just like uh, England and America and France, but even like Germany and I think a couple other countries as well. 
Right? That's what's meant by um, the principle of equal opportunity here. Like these, these words uh, that are like, uh, the hallmarks of liber uh, liberal liberty, right? They, they get um, uh, put in very interesting ways here. And five, um, uh, explicit conflict re mediation re resolution. Uh, they, uh, so as soon as there's some threat to the status quo described, then they would uh, initiate uh, communication. Right? So that's the uh, Ruth Takahiro agreement. The racial ideology that framed and helped generate this inter-imperial reality is exemplified in Senator Beveridge's speech before the US invasion of the Philippines in 1898. Uh, let's see. Oops. Oh, I don't have this. I'm sorry about this. So I'll quote it here, um, quote, the Philippines are ours forever. And just beyond the Philippines are China's illimitable markets. We will not abandon our opportunity in the Orient. We will not renounce our part in the mission of our race, trustee under God of the civilization of the world. Our late, late, largest trade henceforth must, henceforth must be with Asia. The power that rules the Pacific is the power that rules the world. My own belief is that there are not 100 men among them who comprehend what Anglo-Saxon self-government even means. And there are over 5 million people to be governed. What alchemy will change the oriental quality of their blood and set the self-governing currents of the American pouring through their Malay veins, end quote. Right? So this is the speech before the uh, war on the Philippines. Uh, um, okay, so let, let me move forward here. Um, so imperialistic racial formation. So um, uh, in what I think, most uh, US discussion about racial formations has to do with domestic mechanisms, domestic forces. Um, and there's some that are, in, you might say, liminal uh, border politics, like immigration, that's both international and domestic. Right? But is there anything to be said about extra, uh, extra national, international, imperialistic racial formations? Well, one obvious thing is uh, racist ideology. So in the imperial enterprise, Asians de are depicted as lacking the biological cultural qualities to support self-government and thus needing white Western tutelage or imperialism. And this is, um, I take it, um, something like a, a mass quality is something multitudinous, right? There are many kinds of deficiencies that go into not being able to govern yourself. Right? And uh, Senator Beveridge's uh, piece, um, the quote um, uh, or speech that I quoted, uh, it's a, a pretty uh, vivid illustration of this type of ideology. Um, so uh, this obviously reinforces the cultural deficiency, sometimes alienness uh, ascriptions that are central to more domestic racial formations. Also, uh, at least in the case of Asia, um, most of the imperialism generating or imperialism sustaining wars uh, uh, um, were large scale. Right. Uh, there's an interesting book by the hawkish uh, conservative Max Boot. He's got a uh, really thick book on what he calls the small wars. They're about the scores upon scores of uh, small wars in Latin America by which the U.S. maintained its Monroe dominance. Right? But in terms of big wars, most of them were in Asia, right? starting with the U.S. invasion of the Philippines. Uh, so the Philippines... Um, in 18, okay, good, I have it. Uh, Japan, World War II, North Korea and China, North Vietnam, uh, Laos and C C Cambodia. Uh, and I think because of these wars persisting across the 20th century, uh, one of the conspicuous elements of Asian racialization that we don't get on the domestic scene is the idea of Asians as, as, a, uh, as an enemy. So on the domestic scene, you do have a lot of um, racial formation work that depicts Asians as being culturally alien, culturally inferior, and things like that, as well as the classic biological inferiority stuff. But you also have this new thing, this enemy positionality that becomes really important for the conception of Asians. So Asians become both culturally alien and enemies, right? Um, and, and I don't have time to get into this, but um, the Alien Sedition Act, um, is a really interesting law that gets invoked. There's a very thin line actually between uh, alien and, and, um, and citizen, especially when one is also deemed to be an enemy. In fact, this is the law that was invoked in the Japanese American internment, right? Because Japanese Americans were deemed to be an internal enemy force, like a fifth column of the Japanese army, uh, the Alien Sedition Act was invoked and that's how their citizenship got revoked. 
right? Uh, so it's not simply they, they so uh, Japanese Americans were not interned because of their cultural alienness or inferiority, it's because they were potential enemies, which adds a, a really like a Serbic element to the cultural alienness of Asians. And we get this from imperialistic racial formations, right? Um, okay, so going forward, ooh. Uh, yeah, so so the yeah, so that the uh, uh, so back to Xenos. Uh, actually, I, I do I do find my mouth because saying Xenos rather than Zenos, but uh, um, but yeah, so the combining of these um, the cultural alienness, uh, usually of a uh, with a deficiency implication and enemy positionality, um, it, it uh, figures Asians as a, a particularly nasty type of Xenos. Right, and so the uh, the racism against them gets greatly intensified. Uh, okay, so there's uh, I just talked about race as ideology, but there's also race as a socially social ontologically constructive force. Right? And so imperialism as domination causally generates certain national deficiencies that are cited by anti-Asian racist and xenophobic cultural claims. The subject nations become what their caricatures say. So this forms like a self-reinforcing cycle. When, so because imperialism only props up the host, uh, the subject nation in ways that are advantageous for the imperial nation, uh, but it doesn't. Obviously, it can under it will underdevelop the the uh, uh, imperialized nation, right? And so these will start to become so start to fit the stereotypes that are cast upon them. The justifications that led to this are then confirmed by the social ontological force of imperialism itself, right? Um, this is not just projection of, of stereotypes. It seems to be, there's a real uh, uh, social causal force here. Also uh, due to imperialism generating our, uh, I'm sorry, um, and, okay. Uh, another thing is that imperialism to the US becomes a compelling route out of the destitution created by US imperialism. Sometimes this could be simply because of capitalist underdevelopment. Countries becoming so poor. A good example is the Philippines. Uh, I mean, I, I believe I think it's still true now, but more of the country's GDP is generated by expatriate uh, Filipinos than uh, Filipinos within the country itself. Right, and this um, this is a country that's been colonized by Spain for hundreds of years, uh, the U.S. for uh, decades. Right. Uh, so um, no wonder there's a, a, a very strong immigration circuit from the Philippines to the U.S., right? But also sometimes the countries due to warfare, imperial warfare, become unlivable, right? Mm -hmm. A good example is the Viet, uh, in the Vietnam War, right? The South Vietnamese, uh, they literally know where to go. They're sometimes called boat people, right? Uh, and, uh, and fortunately, the U.S. brought them in, right? Um, so this is not simply about ideology project or like a stereotype projection, right? Uh, imperial wars actually generate this type of Im immigration problem. This doesn't necessarily mean that all Asian countries or Latin American countries have, um, have been so uh, impoverished by U.S. imperialism or uh, made destitute by U.S. wars such that uh, this is an issue, but many of them certainly this seems to be a huge factor. Uh, you might even put that, again, I want to keep using as much Rawls as possible just to show that this is not some, this is not some uh, radical, um, you know, a heart to negri type, um, type of account, <laughs> although they're kind of really interesting. But anyways, uh, this could be put in Rawls in turn. It might even invoke um, um, your own late Charles Mills uh, and uh, the, some of the work of Joseph Cairns. I, I think one of the interesting move, one of the many interesting moves that Charles Mills makes is using the Rawlsian machinery to argue that uh, we can develop transitional justice principles, right? what he calls uh, corrective justice uh, principles. Right? Uh, Joseph Cairns uh, focuses more on simply the, the global uh, immigration context where whatever principles of distributive justice a society forms has to be uh, has to incorporate that international context. So what we need are not simply uh, distribution principles, but global distribution principles. Well, we can combine these two points now with regard to imperialistic uh, racial formations. Maybe what we really need are corrective global uh, distribution principles, things that undo the damage of uh, racialized imperialism. Um, we could talk very abstractly about European and US empires, but um, or empires are all, all around the world. But if we just focus on the US, there's there's so much historical data that shows that really was tremendous damage in Latin America and, and Asia. 
right? So these, these claims have some purchase, right? Um, uh, a third uh, a, a way in which a race is, uh, can um, play a social ontologically constructive forces, it's kind of, I, I'm not sure how far to push this, but if um, America, uh, the US, sorry, uh, it has imperial dominion over say the Philippines, uh, various times, Korea, Vietnam, et cetera. Uh, isn't it in some sense, important sense, an Asian country? Uh, because, of, because of its uh, sovereignty, uh, because of the sovereignty structure of imperialism. Right? Uh, if that's true, then maybe there's some type of elision to be made between the concept of Asian and American. Usually when we think of Asian American, we use this phrase with a, a space in between. Uh, some decades ago, people used to hyphenate Asian American. It meant uh, uh, somebody who lives in America, uh, but of Asian descent. But um, you know, if we take seriously the idea of, if U.S. imperialism sort of messes up the categories, then perhaps we ought to adopt, this is from someone named David Palumba Lu over at Stanford. He suggests that maybe we ought to use a solidus, right? Asian American as meaning potentially Asian uh, and or Asian American. Right? So it could be somebody who lives in the Philippines or somebody who is a Filipino American, right? Um, uh, yeah, that's um, a little bit more of a playful point, but something to think about. Okay, so um, uh, implications for some of this for um, Thomas McCarthy. So, uh, in Race, Empire, and Human Development, Thomas McCarthy wonderfully explains how racial formations as social ontological forces uh, and developmentalist and social Darwinist racial ideologies were central in making Euro-American white imperial domination formative of the modern world as such. Uh, this is a great contribution to political philosophy and philosophy of race, and I was delighted to see that he offers some discussion of U.S. imperialism in Latin America and Asia, not just British, French, and Spanish imperialisms. But over the course of the book, he makes two shifts. In regard to imperialism, he develops a predominant focus on European imperialism, especially in Africa. And in regard to racial formations, he concentrates attention on American blackness, anti-blackness. Uh, there's nothing wrong with either shift per se. We need more work uh, on European imperialism and, and their legacies and more work on American anti-Black racism because the legacies continue to haunt us. But I think what actually prompts this double move in, in McCarthy is the effects of the Black-White binary. Here are his words, quote, I shall focus here on only one of the major racial formations that disfigure our past and present, the one associated with racial slavery and its aftermath. Um, now, why does he say this, right? He gives two reasons. First, quote, the logics and dynamics of the constellations associated with the dispossession and near extermination of Native Americans, the forceful subjection of the inhabitants of territories conquered from Mexico, da, 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 and the exclusion of immigrants are sufficiently different to warrant separate treatments. No problem. Second, he says, Quote, moreover, it is the black-white divide that has most deeply marked the topography of American racial politics from before the Civil War to the present day, end quote. So what is meant by deeply marked here? If it just means what people generally discuss, get excited about, or what our civic forums and narratives highlight, then I think he's right. And the now many critiques of the black-white binary could be invoked and he could then have said that I am simply addressing the status quo and thereby leave open the idea that the racial pol political topography of the US is actually configured by say, Amerasian imperial dominion as well as anti-black racism. That white supremacy in the US is a many headed hydra in other words, right? But he does not make this move. I think his position is that the US racial political topography is in fact centrally, exclusively centrally configured by slavery and anti-Black racism. If the foregoing material in this paper is right, then we need to add uh, other deep markings of the topography, including Amerasian racial imperialism. And a discussion of race and imperialism, the ostensible centerpiece of his book, can lead one to precisely this conclusion. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>